This is an Australian Book Review podcast. Thank you for downloading this first episode of the ABR podcast. I'm Peter Rose, editor of ABR. The ABR podcast is a new monthly podcast produced by Australian Book Review. It will feature extended interviews and major features from the magazine, such as essays, reviews and short stories, recorded and discussed by their authors. Each episode will focus on a different subject or author, reflecting the rich variety of content published in the magazine. Martin Thomas is a writer, historian and documentary maker, currently based at the Australian National University. His books include The Many Worlds of R. H. Matthews, which won the National Biography Award. In 2013, we published Martin Thomas's Calibre Prize-winning essay entitled Because It's Your Country, Bringing Back the Bones to West Arnhem Land. This powerful story of the repatriation of Aboriginal remains soon became the best-read article on our website, and we are delighted to be able to launch the ABR podcast with it. Because it's your country. Bringing back the bones to West Arnhem Land. Read by the author, Martin Thomas. The morgue in Gunbalanya holds no more than half a dozen corpses. And as usual, it was full. When the old man died in the wet season of 2012, they had to fly him to Darwin, only to discover that the morgue there was already overcrowded. So they moved him again, this time to Catherine, where they put him on ice until the funeral. The hot climate notwithstanding, things can move at glacial speed in the Northern Territory, where the wags tell you that NT stands for not today, not tomorrow. The big departure had stalked and yet eluded the old man in recent years. Now he would wait six months for his burial. Only then would he be properly finished up, as they say in Gunbalanya, a place rich in many things, poverty and euphemisms for death among them. The old man's name is indelibly associated with Gunbalanya, a settlement on the western border of the great Aboriginal reserve of Arnhem Land. But it is a name that cannot be used. In northern and central Australia, it is customary, as a sign of respect for the dead and those who love them, to avoid uttering the name of the deceased. The taboo on naming derives from a wider process of purging that traditionally occurred at the time of death, in earlier times, and sometimes even today, the possessions of the deceased were quickly burned or disposed of in other ways, the initial rites of grieving involving preliminary treatment of the body were rapidly performed, the site of death was abandoned. The transition to a more sedentary way of living means that it is no longer so simple to shift camp, while the high mortality rate, compounded by the financial impost and logistical complexities of assembling the necessary mourners has resulted in an almost farcical backlog of funerals. All of this contributes to the interminable prolongation of sorry business. Nobody likes it, but no one knows how to change it. When people die, their house and the other places they frequented are treated with the pungent smoke of green ironwood leaves. The persons close to them, and those who handled them after death, are also smoked. Smouldering boughs are brushed against the torsos of these mourners. Alternatively, they stand near a fire and fumes are wafted about them. The purpose of these rites is to decontaminate the living from their contact with the dead, and to protect them against the spirit who at this transitional moment, might be confused, angry, mischievous, or worse. The great changes of the past century have done little to diminish the potency of the spiritual realm, from which a person emerges at the time of conception, and to which they return 
when mortal life has ended. The conventions require that I do not name directly the old man, whose last great work is the subject here. Formerly, he is referred to by the death name chosen by his relations, Nagojok Nayengo. But I will refer to him by the more familiar Wambut. This is the binning way, the way we would speak of him if we were in Gunbalanya now. Binning is the word for man in the Gunwingu dialect of the local language Binning Gunwok. The Aboriginal people of the West Arnhem region use it as a generic descriptor for themselves. Wamud was the old man's skin name. I addressed him as such even when he was alive. This is customary among Binning, who generally avoid using a person's name in their presence, preferring instead the terms of address that affirm the kin relationships that bind everyone together. Wamud often called me Bulang. That is my skin name, given to me by another old man, Godjok, when he made me his classificatory son. That was his skin name, and I must refer to him as such, for only a week before Wamud's long-awaited funeral, Godjok himself finished up. While anthropologists, when they first encountered these sorts of classifications, tended to emphasise their rigidity, the kinship system is in reality highly adaptive, as is evident in the practice of giving skin names to outsiders who are thereby positioned in the local taxonomy and, it is hoped, integrated to some degree into the network of reciprocal obligations that are at the core of binning sociality. The taboo on naming extends to representations of the deceased person, including photographs, films and voice recordings. Contrary to popular belief, the taboo is temporary. As time passes and mourners become reconciled to their loss, the person's name and image are permitted to resurface. How long this takes varies considerably. The age and status of the deceased have great bearing on the matter. In Wamud's case, it will be some years until the people of Gunbalanya speak of him again by his true name. He was a preeminent figure and an acknowledged leader, not only among Binning, but also among Balanda, as white people are known in Arnhem Land. When speaking or writing, there is no restriction on telling stories about the man whom we call Wamud. It is the naming of him that is the problem. Even at his funeral, held at an overflowing Anglican church in Gunbalanya in June 2012, extended eulogies were delivered and the memories encouraged to flow. My contact with Wamud, which began in 2006, was all to do with memories and their preservation. Historic films and sound recordings, made in Gunbalanya in 1948, were the impetus for my visiting the area. Equipped with digital copies of these films and records, which were originally intended for anthropological study, I hoped to interpret them with the true experts, their traditional owners. Produced during a post-war extravaganza known as the American-Australian Scientific Expedition to Arnhem Land, the films and recordings had been archived in collections in Sydney and Canberra. While study of them marked the beginning of our acquaintance, Wamud and I became friends more recently when we were entangled in some filmmaking of our own. That footage I can revisit privately, but it cannot be made public until the mourning period has ended. Inevitably, the footage shapes my impressions of him, even as I try to separate the diminished, although still marvellously lucid figure recorded by the camera from the charismatic and physically robust individual whose eyes sparkled with astonishment when, on that first meeting, he was asked if he would like to see some film of the initiation ceremony known as the Wuba. 
Back in 2006, as a new chum to Northern Australia, I was fortunate in having as a guide and tutor the linguist Murray Gard, a fluent Gunwingu speaker who is intimately versed in cultural protocols. Ceremonial knowledge in Arnhem Land is deeply gendered, and the Wuba is exclusive to men. To escape the gaze of unauthorised eyes, we retreated to the edge of town and set up my laptop in the hut of another old man, a distinguished painter, who is now also finished up. He and Wamud were close to tears by the end of the film. Much of the emotional impact of the material is due to the breakdown of localised ceremonial traditions, of which the Wubar was a key example. For reasons not easily explained, performances of Wubar became ever more occasional from the 1950s. By the 1970s, it was defunct. This was not because male initiation had died out, as it has elsewhere in Australia. In West Arnhem Land, it continues to this day. Instead, Wubar was displaced by the pan-regional Gunapipi ceremony, a very different rite dedicated to the rainbow serpent, which would emerge as the dominant mode of initiation. For Wamud, watching the old footage rekindled memories of the exquisite dance and music at the heart of the ceremony, and of his old teachers, finished up long ago, who had inducted him into the rite. After Wamud had seen the footage, he dictated a statement in Gunwinku that Gard has since translated, asking that he has been given access to this and kindred documentation. I quote, Today, I've been shown the movie of the Wubar ceremony, taken a very long time ago, and so I wanted very much to see this. I was a young boy at the time, and so I would like you very much to be able to make a copy for me, so that in quiet times when I'm not working, I'll go back to my camp and watch the images. It will make me reflect on all I know about that Wubar ceremony, and how, at that time, it was close to disappearing. Today, that ceremony is gone. It lies buried forever. And so seeing that movie brought it back to mind again. Who can we find today who knows about that ceremony? A few of us know, but those old people are all gone now. I would like to hold on to it. Myself and the other senior men here, we would share it together and gather together to watch it. We will watch to see how all those years ago we were initiated by those old people into that Wubar ceremony. If we don't see this film again, we won't be able to remember. Maybe all we would have is a name. The Wubar ceremony has come alive again in those images they made. That is all. Four years passed, and my excavation of the archives generated by the 1948 expedition continued. A trip to Washington yielded a significant cache of films and photographs, of Wubar and many other aspects of the binning world. In 2010, when Wamud expressed interest in making a film, it was clear that he had little hope of seeing it in its finished state, he had cancer, diabetes, and more. As he admitted, beer, cigarettes, and rough living had taken their toll. We all spoke of him as the old man, this being respectful in a society where advancement in age confers prestige rather than irrelevance. But Wamud was hardly old by most people's standards. I doubt that he was 70. It is hard to be certain for he was born in the bush, where births went unrecorded. He was a baby when his family came into Gunbalanya, then known to the wider world as Owen Pelly Mission. Of course, by the standards of his own community, Wamud 
was an old man. Indigenous life expectancy in the Northern Territory is even bleaker than it is for the rest of Australia. Territorian males who are Aboriginal can expect to live 61.5 years compared to 75.7 for their non-Aboriginal contemporaries. With his raft of health problems, Wamud was heavily medicated and suffering excruciating pain. Cruel indignities had been inflicted on his once towering form, perennially crowned by a black cowboy hat. The hat remained while its wearer shrank. His attenuated physique, skeletal in its wheelchair, formed a surreal contrast to his face, lightly whiskered, devilishly handsome, and still exuding the playful quizzicality of earlier years. Infirmities notwithstanding, Wamud inhabited his body with the same ease that he must have borne as a mature, initiated man in his physical prime. An operation had reduced his right foot to an ugly stump, but he made no attempt to hide it. Old Wamud knew that he was racing against time when he poured what he could of his precious energy into making the film. His motives for doing so were in a way obvious. He wanted to leave a record for future generations. I guess he knew that the footage would be suppressed during the mourning period and that eventually it would resurface. Characteristically, he was never a passive subject during our filming sessions, and I now realised that he was thinking very laterally about the type of personal record that he was leaving. This is apparent in the hours of interview material that are presently embargoed, although it is more overt in other footage filmed at his instruction in which he doesn't appear. On the first day of what would be our last shoot with him in July 2011, Wamud asked to be taken through his ancestral country, west of Gunbalanya, to the East Alligator River. I was driving with him in the passenger seat. Addis Hondo, the cinema photographer with whom I collaborate, and Suze Horton, our sound recordist, sat in the back. At the causeway known as Kale's Crossing, Wamud asked Addis to get out and film the water. The river is the border between Kakadu National Park, which Wamud had helped establish, and the vast patchwork of Aboriginal homelands that is Arnhem Land. You can make what you like of Wamud's directive that we film the river. Paying homage to this beautiful country, as he often called it, picturing, singing, honouring it, was always paramount. Clearly, filming the country was a way of marking his territory. But the more I look at the footage, the vegetation moving subtly with the breeze, the rush of water through the frame, it acquires a portent that I never perceived when I stood with Addis by the tripod, and not only because the river, almost too obviously, is a symbol of life. Although located some 50 kilometres from the coast, the East Alligator is tidally affected at Kale's Crossing. With the assault of an incoming tide, the river promptly changes direction, and within metres the formerly innocuous causeway becomes impassable. A channel that flows in both directions, a saltwater phenomenon in freshwater country, it recalls the belief common to various Aboriginal cultures of the northern coastline, that the recurrent transition between life and death, between mortal and spiritual existence, is manifest in the ebb and flow of the tides. It is not, I think, so very far-fetched to find a portrait, as well as a landscape, in that footage of the ever-moving river, a site in which death as much as life is a creative force. As I look at that footage, 
which during Wormwood's lifetime I would have been inclined to use for nothing more than the odd cutaway in our planned documentary. I find it suffused with his presence, although he sits outside the frame. One year earlier he had pointed out a shallow sandstone overhang, where human bones lay piled in the dirt. He wanted us to film them, and later spoke of them not as bones, but as a man in his country. This is relevant, for it was the restoration to their country of just such men and women that constituted Wamud's last great work. Outwardly dishevelled and chaotic, the larger Aboriginal settlements like Gunbalanya are usually composed of a network of smaller communities, referred to as camps. Godjok lived in Agluk camp, so called for its proximity to a boulder-strewn rise called Agluk, a site of ceremonies. Wamud lived in Bunyan camp, named after a bunyan tree of special significance. The designation camp suggests that even now, more than a century after the pioneer buffalo shooter Paddy Kale began farming and developing the site that would later fall into the hands of missionaries. The town has a transitory or provisional status, though for many occupants this mobility is more a dream than a reality. Few binning own vehicles, so it is difficult to travel to Darwin, to distant ceremonies or to the small camps or clusters of huts that constitute the outstations, tiny settlements on often isolated homelands. Numbering 1,171 inhabitants according to the 2011 census, Gunbalanya is a large settlement by Arnhem Land standards. It offers some employment and other attractions, two shops, a meatworks, an art centre, clinic, school and, controversially, a sports and social club licensed to sell alcohol. Wamud was a regular at this institution and took pride in having played a role in its establishment. Wamud shared his house with his wife, who has passed away and cannot be named, and an indeterminate number of younger relatives. It was a metal construction, green in colour, no more or less dilapidated than those around it. The carcass of a four-wheel drive had made of the yard its final resting place. When Wamud's energy allowed, I worked with him on the veranda. It was there that he and I watched a movie, copied from the National Geographic Society Film Archive, that shows the bones being stolen. That Aboriginal human remains were fetishised and collected in the name of science, and often taken to institutions in distant lands, is hardly breaking news. But the idea of bone-taking being captured in a National Geographic film production, in colour no less, shocks me even now. As with other inconvenient realities, ranging from land theft to massacre, there is a tendency to compartmentalise bone-taking as a predilection of the 19th century, when, as the film shows, it was nothing of the sort. We first see the bone-taker reaching into the hollow of a crevice. His rear end, protruding towards the camera, is stained with channels of sweat. Then, turning to face us, he unwraps a jawbone from a blackened shred of rag, evidence, one would think, that it is hardly of great antiquity. Bespectacled, and with lips pursed beneath a trim moustache, his officer's deportment is upset by a slash of blue headband that gives him an air of piratical craziness. He adds the jaw to a wooden crate, already full of arm and leg bones, butted up against a skull. The Bone Taker's diary, which I've read closely, makes it plain that the presence of the photographer was prearranged. 
Built into the act of seizure was the attempt to transcend its fleetingness. Perhaps in an attempt to give it scientific import, the archaeologist and the cameraman made of the theft a pedagogical performance. We can see the archaeologist lifting and handling the skull he has taken, pointing out distinctive features, and then slotting the jaw in place and presenting to the camera its largely toothless grin. The final seconds of the sequence show a glimpse of scenery from the top of Inyalak Hill, which, for any local, is immediately identifiable as the site of the theft. There is a body of water, a yellowed strip of land, a few scant dwellings. We are looking, of course, at an earlier incarnation of Gunbalanya where, some sixty years later, Wamud and I sat on his veranda, grimly watching the spectacle on my laptop. The footage ends when the archaeologist and an assistant, a white man not seen until now, cross the frame and clamber downhill. Manhandling the now lidded crate, they disappear from the picture. The diary records that the film was taken on 28th of October 1948. The cameraman was National Geographic magazine photographer Hal Walker and the archaeologist was Frank M. Setzler, head curator of anthropology in the United States National Museum, now the National Museum of Natural History, a division of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. They were visiting the region as members of the American Australian Scientific Expedition to Arnhem Land. Just five days before Setzler took the bones, he and his fellow researchers had enjoyed the considerable honour of being admitted to the Wubar ceremony, thereby producing the film and sound recordings that so enthralled Wamud and other old men. The expedition was a large-scale research venture involving 15 men and two women that roved through Arnhem Land for much of 1948. Somewhat propagandist in intent, its chief supporter within the Chifley government was the America-friendly Arthur Corwell, who, before he acquired the immigration portfolio, served as Minister of Information. He was a great supporter of the Adelaide photographer come ethnologist Charles P. Mountford, who led the expedition. Mountford had been lecturing in the United States in the last year of the war, when he came to the attention of the National Geographic Society and the Smithsonian. He persuaded them to sign up with the Commonwealth of Australia as official partners in the expedition, a seven-month anthropological, natural history, photographic and filmmaking adventure intended as an overt display of bilateral friendliness. Needless to say, the inhabitants of Arnhem Land were never consulted about its visitation to their country. Setzler's excavation of mortuary sites, conducted in various parts of Arnhem Land, is thoroughly documented in the official records of the Arnhem Land expedition and in his private papers. The latter are particularly incriminating in that they candidly record the ruses to which he resorted in order to avoid the scrutiny of locals when he took the bones. Two young men, Jimmy Bungaroo and another identified only by his mission name, Mickey, had been assigned to Setzler as archaeological assistants. His diary records that on 9th of October 1948, accompanied by one of these men, he entered a large cave on Inyalak where a skull and numerous long bones, all coated with red pigment, were visible. Setzler wrote, I paid no attention to these bones as long as the native was with me. On 28th of October, the same day he filmed with Walker, although this appears to have been a separate incident, he writes of Bungaroo and Mickey. During the lunch period, while the two native boys were asleep, 
I gathered the two skeletons which had been placed in crevices outside the caves. They were disarticulated, and only skull and long bones. One had been painted with red ochre. These I carried down to the camp in burlap sacks, and later packed in ammunition boxes. Sitzler's surreptitiousness leaves little doubt of his awareness that, even by his own standards, this was theft. Yet he took something else when he stole the bones. A photograph of Bunguru, soundly sleeping on his bed of rock. He is dressed only in a naga or loincloth, and near the lower margin of the photograph are his pipe and tobacco tin, a reminder that those who laboured for the expedition were paid mostly in tobacco. Why Setzler photographed the sleeping youth is not explained. He did caption it minimally, Jimmy Bunguru, my native assistant from Goulburn Island, asleep on a rock. Perhaps he took it to illustrate the tale of how he outwitted the natives when the bones were won. Or perhaps this furtive gesture was a mere extension of the trophy hunting exhibited in his broader quest. Because the sleeper could not authorise or in any way control his portrayal, the photograph displays with rare lucidity the power relations that existed between him and the photographer. Yet as much as it objectifies the youth, the eroticism of the image is unavoidable. Bungaroo is beautiful in his tranquility. The sense of desire that saturates this image can, and perhaps should, be read sexually. Yet it also speaks of the likelihood that a hoarder of the dead will see in the living the dead of the future. That is why this photograph is such a powerful expression of the bone-taker's gaze. The battle to get the bones back is too long a story to tell here in its entirety. It took about a decade from the late 1990s, involving lobbying at an intergovernmental level, and provoked enormous hostility from certain factions at the Smithsonian, particularly within the National Museum of Natural History, an institution deeply divided about the status of its large transnational collection of human remains. What concerns me here is the perspective of people, including Wamud, who had to grapple not only with the hurt caused by the theft of the bones, but also with the considerable challenges posed by their return. The repatriation of the Arnhem Land remains occurred in two instalments. Initially, the Smithsonian would only release two-thirds of the bones collected in 1948 citing an original agreement, brokered by Mountford, that all the collections amassed by the expedition were to be split at the ratio of two-thirds to one-third, with Australia as the host country, the major recipient. Since the entire stock of human bones had been exported to Washington at the end of the expedition, the Smithsonian felt justified in releasing the two-thirds in 2009, an outcome that was by no means acceptable to the traditional owners. Later that year, the Arnhem Land expedition was the subject of a symposium at the National Museum of Australia. The Smithsonian's insistence that it would keep in perpetuity the final third of the human remains was the subject of heated debate, and Thomas Amagula, a delegate from Groot Island, issued a feisty press release comparing the Smithsonian's retention of his ancestors' bones with the US government's efforts to repatriate its own servicemen who had died abroad. Kim Beasley, then ambassador-designate to Washington and a speaker at the symposium, issued a statement that he would personally lobby for the return of the bones when he reached the United States. Negative press coverage resulting from the symposium, seems to have shamed the Smithsonian into voluntarily releasing the remaining third of the bones. 
The second repatriation took place in mid-2010. With Adas Hondo and camera, I travelled to Washington to document the homeward journey. Representing the localities from which bones were stolen were Joan Gumbala, a senior Yolnu man who spent his early years on the island of Milangimbi, Thomas Amagula and Victor Gumadul from Gunbalanya. To the bones they had a double duty, to both bring and sing them home. The National Museum of Natural History and other major galleries and museums that comprise the Smithsonian Institution are situated along the Mall, an almost sacred axis through the heart of D.C., commencing at the foot of the Capitol and ending at the George Washington Monument. It was not the location offered to the visitors from Arnhem Land to ceremonially receive their ancestors' remains. That happened in the town of Suitland, a drab little satellite of the capital, where the real estate is cheap and where the Smithsonian, when it outgrew its storage space in the downtown area, built climate-controlled facilities to warehouse collections. The premises are heavily guarded and encircled by an unscalable fence. Suitland is a caring community, according to the road sign, but when, a few years ago, I was going there daily to research the Arnhem Land collections, colleagues warned me that as a white visitor to a neighbourhood that is desperately poor and 93% African American, I should watch my step. The gated world of the Smithsonian compound, barricaded against the racial political reality of its own doorstep, was an apposite locale for the ceremony that heralded the dispatch of the bones, which curators had packed in cartons that I came to think of as the cardboard coffins. Ceremonies in the museum world are generally to do with openings, bequests or major acquisitions. But here we had come to celebrate, if that's quite the word, a less publicised aspect of the museum business the departure of objects from collections, known as deaccessioning in the curatorial jargon. I say objects with a sense of reservation. Objects, after all, are things, whereas coffins, even if they are only cardboard boxes, are containers of people. There were four cardboard coffins each draped by an Aboriginal flag. Wheeled from the Smithsonian premises on a trolley, they led a stream of diplomats, officials and hangers-on, gathered to honour their departure. Kim Beasley, now ambassador, and Native American employees of the Smithsonian, who warmly supported the Arnhem Land visitors, had spoken movingly. Now outside... As clapsticks pounded like a heartbeat, Joe Gumbala ignited a handful of leaves harvested from a Washington gum tree, and the smoking phase of the ceremony began. There were fifty or so of us milling around in the sunshine. We were a morning party, for this was, after all, the beginning of a very long funeral. Gumbala, as the elder figure among the three Arnhem Landers, had performed from a repertoire of morning songs traditional to northeast Arnhem Land. The light was exquisitely limpid on that northern summer day. A pair of armoured helicopters flew overhead, like hornets intent upon their destination. That was the president and his ubiquitous decoy, someone explained. The bones travelled with us from Washington to Los Angeles, and from Sydney to Darwin. Addis and I flew on to Gunbalanya with Victor. It was at that point that our work with Wamud really began. Beliefs about reincarnation and the origin of spirits among the Gagaju-speaking people of Gunbalanya were described by the anthropologist Baldwin Spencer, based on his fieldwork of 1912. 
As he explained it, the people of the present are reincarnations of the first people who inhabited the country. The spirit, known as the Yaomaru, has a cyclical existence, treading back and forth between the worlds of the living and the dead. When a person dies and the mourning ceremonies take place, the Yaomaru watches over the bones in a role of guardianship. With the passage of time, the Yaomaru divides into two parts. One half remains the original Yaomaru, the other is a discreet, though inextricably connected entity named Iwayu. The two are distinct and have somewhat the same relationship to one another as a man and his shadow, which, in the native mind, are very intimately associated, according to Spencer. After a long period of watching over the bones, the time comes to reincarnate. Iwayu assumes the form of a frog who, with Yaomaru's aid, finds and enters a woman. Iwayu develops into a baby, and in this way the spirit returns to the domain of the living while retaining a presence in the world of the dead. Contemporary beliefs in Gunbalanya, as Wamud explained them, do not exactly equate with Spencer's account. Much has changed in the past century, and Wamud's family is among the few that can claim lineage with the Gagaju, whose estates lie to the west of the town. Christian influence has had an effect here, but in the syncretic cultures of Arnhem Land, the Bible can be treated as a belief system that sits alongside rather than overriding the Aboriginal traditions. So, despite the many changes dating from the 20th century, there are significant areas of continuity between the beliefs articulated by Spencer and those of today. Preeminent among them, and this applies to much of Aboriginal Australia, is the ongoing relationship between a person's spirit and their physical remains. When seated near the cave with the man in his country whom he wanted us to film, Juan would explain to the camera the importance of being put to rest within one's territory after death. He explained that in earlier times the body of the deceased went through various stages of processing. First it was put on a platform constructed in a tree and covered in skins or, more recently, blankets. Later the bones were transferred to an elaborately painted hollow log coffin, planted upright in the ground. This was part of the funeral rite known as Law Kong. Much later the bones were removed and installed in caves or crevices. Wamud explained, they will get all bones they would paint them in either yellow or red ochre, and then they would take them up onto the hill and put them in cave, and they would say to them, in language, I'll leave you here, and talk to them. And then they would tell them, Look, I'm following you. I'm coming too, so wait for me. And they would put them to sleep then, in their own country, in their own territory. Doing all that first, putting someone in the cave, doing that, that was the main traditional owner in there or elderly person who was the last one. And then the next one took over, maybe his son, and it went on. We do it not because... We love you and we leave you here, but because it's your country. We'll come back to you and we'll call out for help if you can help us. Having the bones here, it means that you've got the man still staying in his own territory. 
I can call to him any time because I know he's here. No other questions. I know he's here. I go to that cave and call out for help. Like somebody might be in danger. That's when you really need someone. So the traditional owner would help. And in spirit, they would still help. What I've come to realise in talking about these issues and in being taken to sites where remains were stolen is that the dead never become objects or object-like. This is a fundamental contrast to the Judeo-Christian tradition where death marks a rupture between flesh and spirit, where the soul goes elsewhere. In West Arnhem Land, the precise relationship between spirit and bones is never easily expressed, perhaps because of the limits of my questioning or understanding, because of the linguistic differences, or because there is a range of beliefs about such matters. Most likely, it is a combination of them all. One reason why the behaviour of spirits is not readily pinned down is because spirits have agency, like living people, they can be kindly or malicious, friendly, dangerous, or merely indifferent, healers or spreaders of disease. Accidents or mishaps are often attributed to spirits wreaking mischief. Care is required, even in what you say about them. As I understand it, spirits live in proximity to bones, though they are not embodied within them. Spirits and bones are intimately related. Although one is immaterial and the other material, neither will perish. The living and the dead are coexistent. In this place-based cosmology, it is only natural that a person's bones should be laid to rest in their ancestral estate. For binning, the actions of Frank Setzler were a brazen theft, and it is not really surprising that, when the stolen bones were buried on the edge of Gunbalanya in 2011, Wamud, conscious of the television camera, lectured severely in English to all assembled, Stealing people's bones for study is no bloody good. But to confine the transgression to the act of theft is to understate the gravity and complexity of the problem. Theft is a crime against property, whereas this was a crime against people. The removal of bones is closer to kidnap from this point of view. Taking the bones presented Binning and Aboriginal people from other parts of Arnhem Land with the terrifying possibility that spirits had been wrenched from their country and taken abroad on what Wamud called a long walkabout. Now the Binning must deal with the bewilderment and possible anger of the spirits upon their return to Australia. It took 12 months for the binning to decide how to deal with the repatriated bones. During that period, they were locked in a shed attached to premises occupied by Bill Ivory, Gunbalanya's government business manager. In addition to the two repatriations from Washington, remains returned by other institutions, among them the Museum of Victoria, had been added to the pile of boxes. A few weeks earlier... Steve Webb, a physical anthropologist at Bond University, visited the town to sort the bones. The binning avoided handling or even looking at them for as long as possible. They seemed happy to delegate the technical work to Ballander, and Webb's contribution signalled a significant transition in their recognition as human subjects. The bones had been stolen in the service of physical anthropology, so perhaps it was appropriate that the specialised knowledge of that discipline should be brought to the service of the bones themselves, now that their long walkabout was ending. At the request of Wamud and others, 
Webb was asked to identify the sex of the remains and, insofar as he could, to bundle together the bones of individual people. Wrapped in paper, no longer specimens, but now individual men, women or children, a coloured arrow pointed in the direction of the head, though in some cases the skull was missing. Webb then returned the bundles to their cardboard boxes. They were in this state on 19th of July 2011, when, with a plentiful supply of paper bark sheets torn from trees the day before, preparations for burial began. Reuben Brown, a PhD student who is studying sound recordings made on the Arnhem Land expedition, fetched Wamud from his house, pushing him through town in his wheelchair. Wamud's son, Alfred Nyangel, and other senior men and women were waiting, as were Suze and others with microphone and camera, and Glenn Campbell, a photographer representing the Fairfax Media Group, whose work that day would win him a Walkley Award. A fair amount of discussion had occurred about where the wrapping should take place. Assuming that privacy would be required for proceedings so sensitive, we had used sheets and tarps to screen off a section of enclosed veranda that was part of Bill's living quarters. As with many things that were apparently pre-decided, Wamud reversed his position as events unfolded. The boxes, he declared, would be opened outside in the shelter of a carport. Nothing would be hidden. Only the previous day I had asked Wamud what, if any, of the preparations could be photographed. He said that we should start filming just before the bones were about to be wrapped. Overnight, however, Wamud decided that the proceedings should be documented more thoroughly. I heard later that Glenn Campbell's photographs in The Age, in which the bone handling was depicted in all its stark intimacy, were considered culturally inappropriate by gatekeepers in the Metropole. In fact, all of this was intentionally made open to the public gaze. A blue tarpaulin, laid down on the ground, formed the photographic backdrop. The large pieces of paper bark were brought forth, and pulled apart into thinner layers, establishing the foundation for the work that followed. When the shed was finally unlocked, we gazed at the stack of boxes. As documenter of the repatriation, I don't know that I'd ever been much of an omniscient observer, but from this time I became ever more a participant in the proceedings. Alfred, Reuben and I began to remove the boxes. As tends to happen in binning way, if you hang around long enough, you become part of the action, at least to some degree. We carried the boxes, although significantly, as Ballander, we did not handle the bones. I'm sure Alfred would have preferred us to do so. He had said to Bill the previous week how nervous he was, lest he should be asked to touch them. He was fearful of falling ill or being otherwise molested by the spirits. As Alfred dithered before a box of bones in the carport, Wamud barked at him from the security of his wheelchair and told him in effect to get his act together, to get those bones out of the boxes and prepare them for burial. At a recent conference I showed some of this film. Of course, I had to edit it severely, removing from sight the figure who was, and who in time again will be, centre stage. In the doctored footage, even without his visible presence, his power over the scene is palpable. Or perhaps it is made more obvious because of his invisibility. For what is a taboo if not a form of emphasis? In editing the sequence, Addis and I manipulated not only the visual but also the audible record. For Wamud's chief role in these proceedings was not only to command the living as they went about their labour of tending to the dead, this he did 
with authoritarian severity, but to talk to the spirits, to calm them, assuage them, to tell them where they were. I believe that the necessity of doing this had long preoccupied him, and it explains why he, among the few veteran old people of the community, was qualified to perform the role he did. Lorcon, the hollow log ceremony, is now defunct, but aspects of it survive, as is evident in the way the bones were ochred and wrapped. But most of all, it was Wamud's linguistic heritage that made him uniquely qualified to perform the work required on that day. Gagaju, Oringank, Ere and Megenji were the languages native to Wamud's ancestral estates around the East Alligator River, and the ones, in his estimation, likely to be most familiar to the spirits. Competency in those languages has fairly much died with him, although I suspect that even his was little more than a remnant knowledge. Gunwingu, which arrived in Gunbulanyu with migration from the east, has for the most part replaced these tongues, as has Creole and, to some extent, English. After the burial, he did what he could to translate what it was he said to the spirits, but pain and failing strength prevented much progress. So I must add this failure to my unhappy list of uncompleted tasks. But the gist of it he paraphrased. As each box was opened, he began his incantations. He told the spirits his name. He told them of the major landmarks, Agaluk, towards which their head would lie, and Inyaluk, to which their feet would be pointed. He told them that they had come home and would be laid to rest, not in the caves from which they were stolen, but deep in the ground where no one could take them again. The preparation of the bones lasted the greater part of the day. Wamud maintained his dialogue with the spirits. The men worked on men's remains, women worked on women and children. Red ochre was ground and mixed with water, and not merely applied to the bones, but massaged into them. Wamud said to me, as he presided over this scene of industry, immeasurably satisfied, that they were dressing them. Painted with the pigment of the earth, as in life they had been painted for dance, it was a final kindness from living hand. Fibulas and tibias were quickly coated with a hand plunged into the red solution, rich as blood. The smooth domes of crania were coated, quickly drying to a powdery rust. Eye sockets were daubed with dripping fingers. The discovery of a stray tooth had Donna Najameric, one of the embalmers, testing socket after socket until at last she restored it to its owner. The bundles of bones we had in a way been ready for, but the plastic bags defied all expectation. Inside them were the tailings from the archaeologist's sieve, humanity reduced to splinters and fragments. Big bags bulged with larger pieces like coarse gravel, tiny bags no bigger than drug deals, held quotas of grit. No hope of painting this stuff. After what seemed interminable emptying onto their cushiony layer of paper bark, they were quickly bundled and tied, and the bags, like all the boxes and wrappings tainted by their contact with the dead, were put aside to be taken to the gravesite next day, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The ceremony that ended the long walkabout began with a procession through the town. To my great honour, 
Wormwood asked that I push him in his wheelchair. As we set off with Bill, Alfred, Donna, Wormwood's daughter, Connie, politicians, dignitaries and others, he barked at me constantly to walk slowly, more slowly, slower still, with singers and didgeridoo beside us, guiding the spirits in a current of song that would eventually coax them into the confined space of the grave, we maintained a funereal pace. The boxes of bones were following in a cortege of four-wheel drives. People watching from their houses fell in behind the vehicles as the march proceeded. All were invited, Binning, Ballander, visiting workers and tourists shopping at the art centre. At the gravesite, Wormwood spoke at length, in various languages, to the assembled audience and the spirits. To the latter, he explained that they had been divided into men and women, Binning and Daluk, just the same as if they were camping. The bundles were buried in deep trenches and filled with earth. As the crowd dispersed and headed off for a barbecue laid on in celebration, the boxes and wrappings that had held the bones were torched. A flash of orange and the cardboard coffins were no more. Their destruction, as much as the burial itself, confirmed that the status of the bones as mere objects in a museum had irrevocably ended. I was there a month later, without the film crew. It was the last time I saw Wormwood, who was by then largely confined to the horrific squalor of his bed. I recorded an interview in which he said that he was immensely satisfied with the job we had done. By this he meant the film, of which I had shown him rushes, as well as the greater project of restoring the spirits to their country. I asked whether the film was intended as a guide to those who might be dealing with repatriations in the future. He said that was one of the reasons, but foremost... I think, was the desire to say something about his life and memories and to perpetuate his lifelong interest dating from his childhood on the mission in communicating across cultures. Arnhem Land is rich in many things, poverty among them. He wanted to open something of his world to you and me. He is buried now in his cherished homeland, Meeking Valley, southeast of Cales Crossing. He often spoke of this place. Had it been possible, he would have died there. When, in July 2012, they found room for him in the Gunbalanya morgue, he was brought back to town and laid to rest at last. There was a big church service in Gunbalanya, and then, to use your words, Wamud, they took you to Meeking because it's your country. Hundreds made the journey to camp with him as his body lay resting in a shelter made of boughs. They sang for him night and day, and each and every mourner, black and white, went to sit with him, and in, in their own way, in their own time, in their own language, they said goodbye. As they buried him, small whirlwinds were seen dancing through the campground and were immediately identified as his spirit. At night, young men patrolled the border of the camp and periodically called out to him in Gunwingu, telling him to go back. Go back. Go back, they cried. Go back. Why go back? Wasn't he already back? All finished up and back in his country? Yes, indeed. But they meant back to the spirit world. Back to the place from which he started and to which, we might suppose, he has now returned. For the moment we must leave him at home in his country. 
and avoid for a time the temptation to recall him. This beautiful country, because it's your country, troubled and majestic, battered and beloved, this is his country, the greatest teacher of them all. Martin Thomas's reading of Because It's Your Country, Bringing Back the Bones to West Arnhem Land, was recorded and edited at the Australian National University, where he is Associate Professor of History. ABR would like to thank Dr Thomas and the staff of ANU for their work on this recording. The theme music for this podcast is by David McCooey. Thank you for listening to this episode of the ABR podcast. We'll be back in January 2016 with another episode.